Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 183. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Listen to a bishop, a priest, and a sordid layman about Catholic masculinity. In this episode, we'll hear from a seminarian. The COVID lockdowns and mandates hurt everyone financially. Nearly all of you lost money, and many lost their jobs. I learned this in email conversations with some of you. I learned that many of you are looking for ways to avoid financial worries when this happens again, and make no mistake that the tyrants in government will make sure it happens again. The number of Americans searching for ways to earn an income online has exploded. Some need to replace the jobs they lost. Others want to build an online income to be prepared for when it happens again. Some just want the freedom from being threatened financially again. Stay-at-home moms want to supplement the household income without working outside the home. I get it. The problem is the average person has no earthly idea where to start. I've been spending countless hours researching ways to earn an online income with the help of some friends. I've come up with a bevy of income avenues and reputable courses to help you. Consequently, I've come up with a separate email list for people who want this information. When I gave this opportunity to people on my other email list, the response was overwhelming. So if you want to get the valuable information I'm collecting about how to make money online, just click on the link in my show notes that says, Show Me How to Make Money. I'll begin helping you right away. Christopher McGurn has been on the show before talking about a different topic. In this short interview, he's going to give you his take on strong Catholic masculinity. 
Everyone we've interviewed this month has pointed to Jesus Christ as the epitome and best example of genuine manhood. They point to him not as the gooey, warm, fuzzy people like to make him out to be, but rather as a realistic perception of our God and King. The priesthood in America is overrun with homosexuals, but Father Robert Altier pointed out earlier this month that the real men are stepping up to go into the seminary to become priests. Christopher McGurn is one such man. I hope you enjoy what he says and renew your hope for the future of the priesthood because of men like him. Christopher McGurn, welcome back to the Cantankerous Catholic. How are you, buddy? Thank you so much for having me back, Joe. It's been it's great to be back on here with you. I'm glad we're getting this opportunity to be together again. Absolutely. I really enjoyed you the last time you were on here. Christopher, let's begin by trying to read off the same page. Please articulate for the uh, Six Pack Warriors your understanding of genuine masculinity. Genuine masculinity is all modeled after Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is the quintessence of masculinity. He is the perfection of what it means to be a man. And so that's the that's the easiest way to explain it. Obviously, there's a lot to that that you could that you could talk to. But as far as what it means to be a perfect man, as far as a perfect example of masculinity, it's Jesus Christ himself. So that's I guess that's where where to start with that one. <laughs> well, then let's let's kind of better define that. And I'll tell you why. Yeah. The vast majority of Christians, both Catholic and non-Catholic in this country today, uh, portray Jesus as a warm fuzzy rather than the incarnate word of God. What is your perception of Jesus? Is he a warm fuzzy? Is he a guy who stands up to be a man? What is he? Yeah, he is definitely a man. He's not a pushover. He's not uh, soft by any means. He is merciful. He is compassionate and loving uh, more than we could ever imagine. But he also, when he was angry, he flipped tables and he got a whip out. So you know, he's, he's definitely both. It's, it's not just some lovey dovey guy that, you know, is all purely emotional and he's, you know, he's, he's able to have the tough conversations with people and he does so with humility and charity, but he does so in a firm way in a very firm, a very direct way. And he's, he's not soft in any way. Um, if that, if that makes sense, he was definitely a man's man, and uh, yeah, had a lot of difficult situations he encountered, and he he had to handle it with courage. Yeah, there were uh, there used to be a column in the Wanderer called "The Other Side of Christ," and I never really began to recognize his masculinity till I began reading that column. Of course, I was a new Catholic whenever that came along, uh, but Jesus, you know, they've got him as this warm, fuzzy, gooey, nice guy, you know, kind of thing. And this is the man who wandered around Palestine calling publicly, calling men liars and hypocrites and white painted sepulchers full of dead men's bones. And as you pointed out, he'd flip tables and get out a whip. That doesn't sound like a nice gooey kind of guy to me. <laughs> that, yes. <laughs> that sounds like a man who's going to stand up for what's right and always That's tell right. the truth. That's right. He had his convictions and he was very, very strong in his convictions, very firm, very rooted in what he believed. And he was not afraid of sharing that again, all with love, how he shared it. But he was unwavering, unrelenting. He called it for what it was. He didn't sugarcoat things. He was very direct. And uh, that's just who he was. Amen. Christopher, you're a man in your 20s, and you're getting ready to go to seminary in the fall, but you've spent the better part of three years in the world working since you graduated at Franciscan University. As a man living in the mainstream, how do you feel that strong Catholic manhood is accepted in our society? Well, I think it's rare to find it in the first place in our society. So the few times that you actually encounter authentic Christocentric masculinity in today's society, it's refreshing. Um, 
However, I think the society as a whole, the world at large, does not like um, a strong Catholic man because it contradicts everything that the the world is for these days. It's you know the with all the all the garbage that the world is promoting these days. Like if you're an authentic Catholic man, more times than not, you're going directly against the current of the world. Absolutely, you know. Whenever I was growing up, the common phrase was "It's a man's world." And the vast majority of men in this country were Christian white males. Now we're the biggest minority in the country. (laughs) And it's all because they want to reject us. Gay Pride Month and our month dedicated to the Sacred Heart are both in June. Now, that's a diabolical attack on both the Sacred Heart and Catholic masculinity. Considering that Jesus is the ideal man and the perfect blueprint for Catholic masculinity, how do you think devotion to the sacred heart for young men can help them grow into true manhood? That's a great question. Well, the sacred heart of Jesus is is the core of who he is, right? When you look at who a man is, it, it comes to his heart. What What is his heart? What is his heart striving for? It defines really who he is. And if we as men, especially in a world as confused as today with this whole Pride Month and all of this garbage out there today, if we can run to the sacred heart of Jesus and strive to emulate him, strive to model our own hearts after his sacred heart, then and only then will we find and attain our own Christian identity as men modeled in his image and likeness. So it, it really has to start with our own hearts modeling ourselves modeling our hearts after his sacred heart because if we don't do that we lose our identity as men and in a world that can't even define what a man is today um we're pretty we're pretty screwed if we don't model ourselves after him (laughs) so (laughs) i don't i don't think the i don't think the world is in a place for us to ask you know what does it mean to be a man they can't even define what that means anymore so you know no they really can't and and Men who want to be men are afraid to try to define it. I mean, they're, well, in fact, that's, you know, that kind of leads into our next question. Catholic men, true Catholic men, are hated in this current culture, and they call us derisive names like toxic males, which is why we're using it against them to have a toxic male month in the first place. They also do everything they can to cancel, cower, and humiliate us. What do you think every Catholic man should do to counter this culture that's so oppressive to us? Well, since day one of the Catholic Church, it's never been part of the culture. And what I mean by that, it's been countercultural since its very foundation. The, The culture, in large, the culture has always hated the church. And obviously, we see that today more than we've ever seen it before. So with all due respect, I mean, as a Catholic man, I don't care what the culture has to say about me. I don't. I don't report to the culture. I report to Jesus Christ. So at the end of the day, what actually matters is living for him according to his teachings and his principles rather than what this society tries to indoctrinate you with. Um, Granted, you know, I want to try and to love everyone the best that I can, like Christ did, to follow his example. But that's that's not a way like I'm not going to compromise my masculinity that was bestowed upon me by Christ in order to accommodate a world that has completely lost its moral code and compass, a world that is completely confused and diabolically possessed. I am not going to compromise my Catholic masculinity to accommodate such a lost world, if that makes sense. So yeah, I don't but- I don't really care what the world has to say about me as a Catholic man. I care about what Christ expects of me as a Catholic man. Amen. You know, Christopher, six-pack warriors, I want to expound on something Christopher said. He rightly indicated that from the very beginning, the Catholic Church has been counter to the cultures, every culture throughout history, and that those cultures hate us, hate the Catholic Church. So you have to stand up and be a true man by being absolutely obedient to Christ and his church. What that means is, 
is not caring whether you offend someone with the truth, not caring whether someone doesn't like it when the tr- when you speak the truth, not caring if they try to cancel you or shout you down when you speak the truth. Because as Christopher said, at the end of the day, you have one person to be concerned about and report to, and that's Christ. Christopher, I thought that was an excellent answer. You, you, uh, uh, I think you're going to do well in seminary, buddy. <laughs> Praise God. May he be praised. Okay. I, and I'm hoping you're making a great priest too, because, uh, uh, if, if I have my way, you'll have a mentor and, and, uh, uh, someone to kind of help you through who is rock solid. And we expect you, of course, I'm hoping, uh, to have you on the show some more while you're in seminary, Absolutely, but we're hoping to have you here after you've celebrated your first mass. Ah, oh, that'd be so awesome. <laughs> I would love that. That would be, that okay. would be an honor for sure. Christopher running a hot clock today. Things are a little hectic on this end. Uh, so I really appreciate you having been on the show today and we're looking forward to having you again. Thanks again for having me, Joe. It's always a pleasure to be on here and and uh, just be able to talk about our Lord Jesus Christ together. It's always an honor and a privilege. So thanks again for having me, and I, I really hope and look forward to uh, coming on again. I'd love to, okay. I'd love to do that. Okay, Christopher. God love you. You too. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. Like most graduates from college, Christopher is saddled with massive debt in the form of student loans. It's my understanding that he won't even get a stipend while in seminary. So there's a GoFundMe page set up for him, and the link's in my show notes. Just go to cantankerouscatholic.com and locate this episode. Click on the title, then scroll down below the podcast player to find my show notes. Help Christopher out as best you can. I know that many, many of you either have an unhealthy weight problem or know others who do. I'm excited about what Java Burn is doing for me on weight loss, and that's why I'm sharing it with you here. Full transparency though, Java Burn claims to have an effect on your energy level, making you feel more energetic throughout the day. I haven't noticed that benefit, but everyone's different. You may have more energy, but I haven't. What I have had is a weight loss of about 20 pounds in the two months I've used Java Burn. You may not have results as good as I've had, but yours may be even better. Of course, it may not work for you at all. Who knows? I can only tell you what Java Burn is doing for me. So if you've got a problem with your weight like I've had, you might want to give all natural Java Burn a try. Just click on the Java Burn link in my show notes to see the same video I watched. I'm glad I watched it. Watching it led me to the only way I've been able to lose weight in recent years. I should tell you that due to the supply chain crisis, it took me three or four weeks to get my order of Java Burn. By the way, I'm so sold on this product that I've acquired a six month supply. but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. Uncle Bill came to supper one evening and found out that his little nephew Michael was saving up to buy a dog. Great, said Uncle Bill, who was quite a joker. Look, here are two bills. You can choose which one you like best to help you fund your doggy fund. Uncle Bill had placed a crisp new $1 bill on the table and an old worn $10 bill next to it. 
Michael was too young to know the value of paper money, but he knew some counted for more than others. He much preferred the crisp new dollar bill, but he didn't want to make a mistake. He looked at both carefully. Then he finally turned to his mother and said, Mommy, you choose for me. Uncle Bill was so pleased that he added another $10, which was enough in Michael's box to buy the dog that he really wanted most. We don't always know what's best for us, but we can always count on our mother, the church, for the wisdom and experience that gives us the best for our souls and lives. Holy Mother Church has authority from Jesus Christ to make laws for the faithful, but they aren't merely laws for the sake of control or propriety. The church established canon law from the very beginning of the church in the first century, but it was formally codified in 1234. The current code of canon law was revised and promulgated by St. John Paul the Great in 1983. Canon law can best be described as the heart of the church set in juridical terms. While canon law covers virtually everything pertaining to the church, general norms, the people of God, the teaching office of the church, the office of sanctifying in the church, the temporal goods of the church, sanctions in the church, and processes, there are certain laws that are universally applicable to all Catholics. These laws are commonly called precepts of the church, and the reason the church makes laws and precepts is to guarantee to the faithful the very necessary minimum in the spirit of prayer and moral effort, and in the growth of love of God and neighbor. All Catholics are obliged to keep the church's precepts under pain of sin. Let's take a look at those precepts to which we are all obliged to keep. Number one. You shall attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. This precept requires us to make holy the Lord's Day, to observe special holy days that are meant to recall us to the gospel message, and to avoid those activities that hinder the renewal of soul and body. Failure to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation without being excused for a very good reason, you know, such as too sick to get out of bed or caring for someone else who's too sick to go to Mass, that's a mortal sin. Those who are required by an employer to work Sundays and Holy Days may fulfill their duties by attending the Vigil Mass for those days, but they still must take another day for rest. Anyone who arrives late, normally thought to be after the opening prayer, or leaves early, any time prior to the final blessing, doesn't fulfill the Sunday or Holy Day of obligation, and therefore commits mortal sin. 2. You shall confess your sins at least once a year. This precept ensures preparation of the Eucharist by the reception of the Sacrament of Reconciliation. This is the bare minimum required by the church. If one commits a mortal sin, we have the obligation to receive the sacrament of penance as soon as possible. The church recommends confession once a month, but is happy for the faithful to have recourse to the sacrament weekly. 3. You shall humbly receive your Creator in Holy Communion at least during the Easter season. This is called our Easter duty, and we must fulfill it under pain of sin between the first Sunday of Lent and Trinity Sunday. In order to fulfill the Easter duty, you must actually make the intention during Lent or the Easter season for one communion to be that obligatory reception of the Eucharist. 4. You shall observe the days of fasting and abstinence established by the Church. There are only two days in the United States. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. All Fridays of the year are days of penance, but only the Fridays of Lent, beginning the Friday after Ash Wednesday, are obligatory under pain of sin. On Fridays outside of Lent, we are to perform some act of penance, at least as sacrificial as abstinence, or abstain. Intentional failure to observe these obligatory days of fast and abstinence is a mortal sin. 5. You shall help provide for the needs of the church. This means the faithful are obligated to contribute to the material needs of the church, each according to his own ability. In other words, don't be stingy with the church. 
Statistically, only 10% of parishioners pay for 90% of the church's expenses, and that's not because the 10% are wealthy Catholics. 6. The faithful are to observe the marriage laws of the church and to give religious training to their children. In other words, Catholics are to be married before a priest or deacon and two witnesses. And divorce and an attempt at remarriage is forbidden, a mortal sin. Furthermore, parents are strictly obligated to see to it that their children know, understand, and practice the Catholic faith, which means parents themselves are obligated to know, understand, and practice the Catholic faith. And no, this obligation is not met by sending your children off to religion classes in the parish or at school. Canon 226 is very clear about this. 7. The faithful are to join in the missionary spirit and apostolate of the church. This means we're all obligated to share the gospel of Jesus Christ as handed down by his church. This doesn't mean you have to become a lay evangelist, but you do have to give witness to Christ and his church among your friends, neighbors, and co-workers. You can also help fulfill this obligation by contributing financially to evangelistic endeavors, but this alone does not fulfill the obligation. These precepts of the church are seriously binding on all Catholics. Collectively, they encompass the teachings of Christ from the Gospels and the Apostles after Pentecost. If we fulfill these precepts as we should, we can expect Jesus to be pleased with us at our particular judgment. Intentional failure or slothful failure to fulfill these precepts, well, the particular judgment would not be the happiest time in your existence. If you're taking any prescription medication to control diabetes, or even pre-diabetes, new studies from Italy and New Zealand show that type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes can be managed or possibly even reversed if you know how. While most medications can keep the symptoms of diabetes at bay, they don't actually treat the root cause of the problem. So before you resign yourself to being hooked on medication for life, you've got to see a video about Glucofort. The link is in my show notes. I've been taking Glucofort for two months and it's had a dramatic effect on my blood sugar number. My primary care physician is amazed. So do what I did. Watch the video, then order the package of all-natural glucofort that's right for you by clicking the glucofort link in my show notes. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. John Paul II. He said, Life with Christ is a wonderful adventure. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. Back in the 1950s, a caretaker of a cemetery noticed a man praying at a certain grave each week. In the summertime, he would put flowers on the grave. The caretaker asked the man one day, Who's buried here that he should get so much of your love and devotion? The man replied, This is the grave of a very dear friend of mine. In World War II, he volunteered to take my place so I could stay at home with my wife and kids. He was sent to fight and was killed in this very first battle. They brought him home and buried him here. With tears in his eyes, the man continued, Do you blame me for being so grateful to a man who died so that I could live? Jesus died for you so you could live for all eternity in heaven. Holy Mass isn't the grave of Jesus. It's the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross offered again on the altar. You should go to Mass faithfully, not only because you're bound under pain of mortal sins to go on Sundays and holy days, but also because you want to show Jesus how thankful you are that he died for you.
This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.